These three things are holding you back from career advancement. The confidence tax, the loyalty tax, and the cultural tax. My name is Lisa Appiah. I'm a certified career and resume strategist and the founder of We Apply. At We Apply, we help quiet leaders win at work while staying true to themselves. And let's get right into it. There are certain things that we do that may impact our ability to move up in our careers. And these are some of the things we'll be talking about today. Sometimes you may be doing these things and not even realizing that you're doing them and that it's costing you money and it's also costing you potentially your career. So let's start off with the confidence tax. So the confidence tax as defined by a recent Forbes article, it says that the confidence tax refers to the personal cost that a person incurs from self-doubt, not believing in their own abilities, talents, and gifts. Basically, this tax impacts your professional and personal growth because you're less likely to advocate for yourself and you're not showing up as confidently at work. A study by the University of Messina on this topic found that people who have lower self-esteem or lower self-confidence make approximately $30,000 less a year than their peers who are confident, who are advocating for themselves, and who are showing up at work in an assertive way. So how can you boost your confidence at work? It starts with understanding yourself, having that level of awareness about your skills, your strengths, and your abilities, and trying to find out what is causing that doubt in your abilities and in yourself. Sometimes it may be deeper work that you need to do on yourself to truly understand the value that you offer and get in a position where you have the confidence that's necessary to begin to advocate for yourself, to begin to share your achievements and your accomplishments. So there are tons of resources out there that can support you on this journey. I do have a quiz called the Introvert at Work quiz that helps you uncover your most marketable skills as an introvert. And that basically is a first step to help you really understand what do I bring to the table and how is this helpful to my workplace. And, and when you have a better understanding of who you are and what you have to offer, it does help you boost your confidence. In addition to that, being able to stay on top of what's new, what's relevant in your industry, so if there's a need for skill development, definitely look out for opportunities for trainings, attend webinars, attend seminars, attend conferences. Industry conferences are always helpful. Basically, you want to ensure that the information and the knowledge that you have is up to date, that it's relevant, and that you are showing up as a subject matter expert in the field that you're in. And something that can also help with you boosting that confidence at work is finding mentorship or coaching. It's always great to have someone that you can have as a sounding board, build that relationship with, who's going to give you feedback that's unfiltered, that's objective, that will truly help you grow in your career development and your leadership path. So definitely seek mentorship or formal coaching. And these are ways that you can help increase your confidence. You can help under, better understand yourself and the skills that you have to offer so that you're showing up more confidently at work and you're not paying that confidence tax. All right, so the next one is one that I've been seeing more and more with some clients that I'm working with. A lot of the clients that I work with are people from historically marginalized backgrounds. And what I'm seeing is more and more they're coming to me and saying that they are being tasked to do the DI work within their organization. Some of them have formal backgrounds, some of them don't have formal backgrounds at all. All they really have is lived experience, which is great, but sometimes that doesn't provide you with enough support to be able to lead a DI initiative within a organization or a company but because they're sometimes you know that only person of color there's an expectation that they should be lead leading those initiatives for the organization so this is what we call the cultural tax so let's look at the definition this concept came from academia but it is a concept that we're seeing across industries so it's still relevant so let's take a closer look at the definition introduced by amado padilla 
1994, the cultural taxation refers to the additional burden placed on minority faculty and staff in academic settings where they are expected to take on roles of ethnic representatives and unofficial diversity consultants without formal recognition or compensation. This extra work can lead to burnout and decrease job satisfaction as these employees manage responsibilities beyond their official job description. So if you're paying a cultural tax at work, I'm sure you're, <laughs> you're watching this and you're just nodding and saying, that's my life. So what can you do in terms of your career if you know that you're being asked to do additional work that is beyond your roles and responsibilities there's no recognition there's no compensation and often there's no support as well so what can you truly do in this situation it's important firstly to understand what it is that you want some people are completely okay with this and don't have an issue being the person who is paying this cultural tax because they feel like it's uh, for the greater good and so they are willing to be, be the person who is taking the charge and taking on the additional responsibilities but if you're not that person <laughs> what you can definitely do is set boundaries at work i have another video that i'll tag up here about how to set boundaries at work how to be more confident in your communication to let people know what you have currently on your plate, what is within your roles and responsibilities, what you're currently being paid for, and everything else, well, let's talk about a raise. Let's talk about how I can get additional flexibility for that additional work that I'm doing. So then the next step is definitely have a conversation with the person that you're reporting to. Let them know the amount of work that's going into this. A lot of people think that, oh yeah, you're leading the ERG for one group or another group and they just think that it's just organizing events and that it doesn't take a lot of effort or a lot of time but these things do consume a lot of time a lot of effort it involves building relationships it also involves being able to talk about very sensitive topics that weigh on people and then you're taking that emotion you're taking that burden back with you knowing that you have an or a responsibility for the whole organization it's a lot it can be a lot in terms of work but it can meet be very draining emotionally as well so have those conversations and really let the people you're reporting to understand what this role and responsibility really means there are people that this is their full-time job <laughs> It's not something that you do just on the side of your desk. The other thing that I would encourage you to do is advocate for that formal recognition. Advocate to get that job title that really shows that this is part of your responsibility. Advocate for yourself to be able to get additional compensation for those additional responsibilities that you're taking on. So definitely advocate for yourself so that you're getting that recognition. And lastly, don't be shy to talk about your achievements and accomplishments when it comes to the DEI efforts that you are carrying forward. When your company is going to write that annual report and they're going to have that DEI section, they're going to boast about things that the company did when you know that you were that sole person who actually made all this happen. So don't be afraid to speak about your accomplishments. Don't be afraid to speak about the achievements and the difference that you're making in your company through those efforts. If you're a leader who's watching this, there's definitely things that you can do as well to better support your employees. The first thing is compensate diverse employees fairly, especially when they're taking on these additional responsibilities that, that will ultimately be to the benefit of the organization as a whole. The second thing is acknowledge these roles and responsibilities that they're taking on and make them formal roles, make them formal responsibilities that have recognition within the organizational structure and that have value, that have a voice at the table. It shouldn't be just something that is done at the side of someone's desk, but help, help your employees get that visibility for the work that they're doing and help them in terms of budget. I hear so much that, you know, 
people are doing this work and there's absolutely no budget provided to them or very, very small budgets provided to their ERGs to be able to carry out this work. So if you really believe in the change that these employees are making within your organization, support them not only through recognition, not only through titles, but also with money so that they can do even greater work. And then lastly, set limits in terms of what extracurricular work can be done in addition to someone's actual day job. There needs to be limits, there needs to be boundaries. These are policies that can be developed within your organization to be clear as to what extra work someone can take on because you don't want to get to the point that people are taking on this extra work and then it's actually impacting their actual day job and then it'll impact their performance and then it's just a ripple effect of how this can have a bad effect on the actual employee who's going out of their way to take on these responsibilities. Next, the loyalty tax. I mean, gone are the days where people used to stay at companies for their entire career or for 20 plus years, and that was what they did for their whole career. Gone are those days. There's so much instability in the job market right now, and if you want to be able to progress and to be able to increase your pay, many studies have found that job hopping is definitely the way to go to be able to get skills and knowledge quickly and increase your pay as you're going. So this concept of loyalty, it's valuable because obviously, you know, you want to be able to have loyal employees who believe in your company vision, but it shouldn't now impact their career growth. So let's look at the definition of the loyalty tax. The concept of the loyalty tax at work refers to longtime employees receiving smaller raises or, or less competitive compensation compared to newer employees who negotiate higher salaries because of market conditions that have changed. So basically, the loyalty tax will have a huge impact on employee morale, but also on retention because what's happening and we're seeing this in many organizations is that inflation has happened the economy has changed and some industries are having difficulties bringing on new staff new talent especially after the pandemic and so we saw organizations giving like huge compensation packages, great bonuses to new employees who were coming within the organization, but then those who had been there for years didn't get anything in addition to recognize that loyalty. And so people who are new were coming in at a way higher salary than those who were there for a long time. And so those are the challenges of the loyalty tax. And so as I was saying, one of the strategies that's often recommended is job hopping because if you compare somebody who stays within a company gets a 3% or 4% raise a year compared to someone who's able to hop from one organization to another and they're uh, on average, studies have found that you're able to increase your salary from 13 to 15% by doing that. That already lets you know that, hey, <laughs> the math, it, it, it's not mathing, right? It just doesn't add up. So that already helps you see that there's a huge difference in terms of the pay when it comes to someone who has stayed within a company compared to someone who's job hopping or who's entering the organization. So, so things that you can do in terms of being an employee who is affected by the loyalty tax is asking for a raise, advocate for yourself. Cost of living adjustments are great, but sometimes there is way more that is required, especially with the economy that we're living in currently. So definitely advocate for yourself and ask for that raise. You shouldn't be penalized for your loyalty to the organization. This is something that should actually be celebrated and something that you should get additional recognition for. So if money's not on the table, which is sometimes the case, try to negotiate other things in terms of flexibility when it comes to your work hours, working remote versus in the office, being able to make adjustments to your bonus or make adjustments to your stock package or even your pension. 
These are all things, even vacation, vacation. Let's not forget about vacation. <laughs> These are all things that you can negotiate. Obviously, it's always great to negotiate them at the beginning, but when you're at a point where you're seeing things happening in your organization and you want to formally have the opportunity to have the conversation and make a plan that aligns better with where you are in your life but also ensures fairness within the organization and then the last thing is track your achievements you definitely want to track your achievements you want to go into these conversations being able to back up what you're saying with facts in terms of what you've been able to achieve for the company this is not a conversation to say this person came into the company and they are being paid at this level i'm being paid at that level i want more money that that's not what the conversation is about. It's about you bringing your achievements, you bringing your track record, come with your receipts, come ready to really demonstrate why you are deserving of that raise. And then, and then from the employer perspective, offering additional benefits. This is not about pizza lunch or taking people out for drinks after work. That's not what I'm referring to. Give them things that they actually want. So opportunities for career development, career advancement training, uh, opportunities to be able to upskill, opportunities to be able to get more flexibility in their work schedule. Find out what people actually want and support them in that way instead of, you know, bringing treats and snacks to the office. People, not <laughs> they don't really want that. It's great sometimes, but really what people want is things that will improve their lifestyle in the long run. As I said, I have another video about how to set boundaries at work. Click right there to watch that video and I will see you in that one. Take care.